I really like miniatures. Since I was a kid, I've always thought they were interesting. A miniature world full of miniature objects for miniature people. I just think it's really cool. Even now as an adult, I often find myself watching model making channels on YouTube and have even done a little bit of my own model making with the set of Mystery Vault. I think there's something so lovely about the care and detail that people put into their dioramas and miniatures. It's such a cool art, but did you know that in the 1940s, there were a series of dollhouses that changed the way that we solve crime forever? When you think of forensic investigations, you might think of people combing a crime scene for clues, being fastidiously careful not to disrupt evidence without properly documenting it first, photographing everything and having scientists back in the lab analyse samples for clues in order to find out exactly what happened. But this was not always the case. Our story today is about Frances Glesner Lee and how she changed the way crimes were investigated through her miniatures. Frances Glesner Lee was born in 1878. Her parents were John Jacob Glesner and Frances M. Glesner. Her father made a literal fortune in selling agricultural equipment. So young Frances lived a privileged childhood with her older brother, George, in Glesner House, a literal mansion in Chicago, which was staffed by a number of servants and housekeepers. Frances and George were homeschooled and lived a fairly private, even secluded life. When old enough, George went off to study at Harvard, but Frances's father refused to let her go. This was in the late 1800s, and it was considered unladylike and improper for women to go to university. So she married an attorney, blew at Lee, and had three children. At first, they appeared happy until they divorced, which, for context, it was 1912 when that happened, and at the time, divorce was properly scandalous. When later asked about his parents' divorce, their son would say that it was partly due to Francis's creative urge coupled with high manual dexterity, the desire to make things which her father did not share. I suppose you could say that Francis's husband, now ex-husband, blew it. Glesner Lee was then free to follow her interests, so she followed her interests. During numerous conversations with her brother George's classmate, who was also named George, George Burgess McGrath, who was a medical examiner, her interest was piqued in the field of forensic investigation. Up until this point, it's important to point out, women had not really been at all involved in crime investigation or law enforcement. It was seen as being improper, but that didn't stop Glesner Lee. She learnt that during the investigation of a crime, heaps of evidence was frustratingly lost due to careless detective work. When examining the scene of a crime, evidence was often ignored or lost due to detectives not being observant or by being careless or negligent such as moving key evidence without documenting it or handling things without gloves, contaminating artifacts. <sighs> Extremely few detectives had any medical training as well, so unless a clue was blatantly obvious, it was often missed. As a result, information that might be vital to solving a case was lost. Frances Glesner Lee wanted to change that. Sometime after her divorce, her parents and her brother passed away, which left the family fortune to her. She was therefore very wealthy and used a portion of her fortune to give an endowment to the Harvard Medical School in 1931 to establish the Department of Legal Medicine. Further gifts would establish the George Burgess McGrath Library and the Harvard Seminar in Homicide Investigations, during which she presided over the seminars and would be the only woman in a group of 30 or 40 men. This was a pretty big shock to many early participants, as it was unheard of for women to be engaged in such areas of interest and study, but over time she became accepted into the field. During this time, she would host functions for folks at the Department of Legal Medicine where detectives and medical examiners would come and enjoy evenings where she would meticulously set menus, table settings and floral arrangements personally and then would entertain them and they'd talk about their work. Helping to establish the study of forensic science at Harvard wasn't all she did to assist the development of modern forensic investigations though. Through her interactions with various detectives and medical examiners through seminars and dinners, it became clear to Glesner Lee that there was work to be done in training 
new detectives in identifying clues in a precise systematic way to ensure the most effective investigation possible. This was difficult to do, as it wasn't really possible or appropriate to take whole classes of detectives into real crime scenes to do the training. This is where her forensic dollhouses came into play. For sensitivity's sake, I'm going to show images of the dollhouses here with doll victims blurred. Even though they are dolls, the situations they find themselves in are based off real crimes, and some folks might find it upsetting. If you wanna see the uncensored versions, you can find them in the resources to this video. There's a link to that document in the description below. Frances Glesnerly was a creative person who loved to make things, and she was enthusiastic and quite talented when it came to miniatures. To help train the next generation of forensic investigators, she created crime scene dioramas that were meticulously crafted with extremely fine and specific details to provide clues about a crime. These dollhouses were not based on any one particular crime, but each was a combination of details from a series of real crimes that Glesner Lee developed using a huge range of police reports. Over time, she would come to make at least 18 of these, which were named the Nutshell Studies of Unexplained Death. The rooms were designed to mimic what an investigator might find when arriving at the scene of a crime, complete with bodies that were designed with the assistance of coroner's reports with bloating and discoloration, so as to enable investigators to begin predicting time and cause of death, as well as other details, such as the date on the calendar, minuscule bullet holes, and blood splatter patterns on walls. These extremely fine dioramas took many hours and between three and four thousand dollars each to create. Glesner Lee's attention to detail was intense. She knitted miniature stockings, created working locks for windows and doors, had scaled down working lighting fixtures, and had written tiny letters using single head paintbrushes to get the fine brush strokes. With these dollhouse dioramas, Glesner Lee held seminars where classes of training detectives would come and try to deduce what happened. The actual events of Glesner Lee's imagined crimes were always kept secret so that the trainees could approach it as though it were a genuine crime scene. This was revolutionary in the way that crimes were investigated. With the meticulous documentation of crime scenes and with evidence being a key part of investigations, Glesner Lee also made an effort to include those who many of the time might have brushed over due to prejudices. Many of the victims of the crimes were women, and many from the fringes of society, requiring trainee detectives to approach cases with respect and a careful eye, regardless of whom the victim was. Frances Glesner Lee died at the age of 83 in 1962, after which her endowment to Harvard's legal medicine department stopped. The nutshells were used by Harvard as teaching tools until after her death, until the department was dissolved in 1967, after which the dioramas were transferred to the Maryland Office of the Chief Medical Examiner where they could continue to be used as training tools and have been loaned out to various institutions and museums from time to time. There have been very few minor adjustments to the nutshells, with the lighting being changed to LEDs because the original incandescent lights produced quite a bit of heat, which may over time cause damage to the models, though this was no easy task. The man responsible for the replacement of the lightings was Scott Rosenfeld, and I do love it when people who share my first name show up in these stories, so I had to mention him. Rosenfeld was the Smithsonian Museum's lighting designer who had to recreate the atmosphere of the models, which originally contained at least 17 different kinds of light bulbs. He was extremely impressed with Glesner Lee's work. So with the financial investments she made into forensic medicine and the time and labor investments she made into the training of investigators with her nutshell dioramas, Frances Glesner Lee is a significant figure with a lasting legacy through the way crimes are investigated today. And all this from someone who, because she wasn't a man, did not have an easy task in doing doing any of these things, but she didn't let that phase her. She remained an active member around the university and 
has earned herself the nickname of being the mother of forensic investigation. She continued even into her old age, with many of the detectives who benefited from her training or investment referred to her affectionately as mother and many would send her Mother's Day cards. Frances Glesner Lee was one of the people who turned forensic investigations into a science, using her influence and connections to access areas no women had really gone before because of the societal barriers of the time. She broke down gender barriers, challenging the thinking of many people, and her legacy is very much seen throughout forensic investigations today. Frances Glesner Lee followed her interests, overcame obstacles and created some amazing miniatures, all in order to teach and change the way crimes are investigated. I think that's pretty cool. Thanks very much for watching this video. If you want to find out more, as always, you can find a document with my resources in the description of this video. I'd love to know what you thought about this video in the comments below and with the like button. That's also one of the ways that YouTube shows my videos to more people. If you haven't done so already, I encourage you to subscribe to That's Pretty Cool, where I delve into topics and ideas that inspire in me a sense of curiosity and wonder. Thanks again for watching, take care, stay curious, and we'll see you next time.